Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Darren Olin. I work with Napa Green for nearly a decade now and very much part of their journey. Um, I often think, uh, sorry, first off, thanks very much for inviting us here from uh, Autonomous. Um, so who let the guys from the petrol stations in and why are we here? I'm considering the forum that's here and I, I would like to emphasize four courts are very much part of the ecosystem of the transport industry. And um, our challenge in the industry now is to remain, you know, part of that e ecosystem into the future. And electric vehicles and all that's coming with that uh, is a very big, big challenge. Um, I started off with uh, titling this presentation The Red Queen Race. Um, the quote from The Red Queen is, now here you see, it takes all the running you can do to keep in the same place. Um, I think this is very, very relevant for us in the forecourt industry. I estimate it's very relevant for OEMs in the car industry and probably many more in your subsequent industries that you're in. And if we think about that for a second, you have to work as hard as you can just to stay where you are, to keep your market share, or just to stay in the industry or stay where you're relevant. Stay relevant. That is very, very much relevant now with the horizon of electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids, and, and again, very relevant to us in the forecourt industry. A little bit of a, just a, it's a personal interest of mine, a little bit of background behind the Red Queen race. It's a, a Lewis Carroll quote, um, uh, the author Lewis Carroll. He uh, wrote the book, it's the sequel to Alice in Wonderland Through the Looking Glass. Back in 1872, a hundred years later, a load of evolutionary scientists coined the phrase, the Red Queen hypotheses. And to give you a very, very brief uh, background to that is they used it to explain why dinosaurs went extinct. They, um, their genetics and DNA did not evolve with the climate, so they became extinct. That is exactly what a Red Queen race is. You go extinct if you cannot evolve with your changing climate. And that's very much what Apple Green feel we're in uh, as we head to the future in the forecourt industry. We're in a very intense Red Queen race that is changing, and it's incumbent upon us to try and change with that. Um, to prove uh, who's dropped out of the race, and these are very sizable brands, particularly this is Ireland, for example. You know, we've lost a lot of serious brands. These guys couldn't keep up. That's how intense the forecourt industry in Ireland. I should put a little asterisk there beside Topaz. In all fairness to our peers there in Topaz, they're not dropping out of the race far from it. They're beefing up. Uh, they're now becoming Circle K. But the Topaz, the brand, is also dropping back to become some bigger and healthier uh, and fit for the, the Red Queen race that we're entering into. And that, again, all driven very much on the horizon by electric vehicles, plug-in hybrids. So the Irish forecourt industry, I'm not sure do many of you know here, but actually we're one of the uh, leaders of the forecourt industry uh, in Europe. Uh, and, most, uh, and certainly arguably up there in the world. Uh, you'll find a lot of the forecourt industries, Apple Green, our peers, Topaz, um, Maxall, and, and the rest, winners of the NACS convenience stores, things like that. Um, it is very much competitive, but what I want to kind of get across to you guys is the players in the industry here in Ireland are give or take top of the game. Um, think of ourselves, Circle K, Maxall, Texaco, they're very much heavily vested in, and we're moving with it at an intense pace. Now, most of that innovation and pace is happening in the store currently. But what I want to get across to you, yes, they're strong, fit companies. Uh, we're in a highly competitive environment. But within what we've done in the stores and things like that is we've generated an entrepreneurial and innovative culture. While that's happened in the stores, don't underestimate our ability uh, to use that innovation and that culture that we have all generated in our, in, our, in our own companies to apply it to the forecourt trade. And I would say to you, and I don't necessarily uh, get the brief to speak for all our peers here, but I can tell you we're all very well ready to change and adapt to um, embrace what's coming on the horizon. The companies there, if we touch on some of them, we've generally all got international connections. Apple Green has expanded uh, to the US uh, with over 100 locations, or nigh on 100 locations there, over 100 in the UK, and that's dramatically going to increase. That in itself gives us learnings. The Goliath of all these um, is Circle K. They're really learning a lot from Norway in particular, and they're going to use that in their uh, other stores across the world. Our experience initially now is telling us that the US might be somewhere up to 10 years behind, simply because, behind in the sense of adaption to, and prepared to adapt to electric vehicles, simply because 
uh, fuel prices are so low, depending on the state, it could be as much as 30% the price of what we pay here. It makes it more difficult to adapt. But again, like I said, Circle K have that presence in Norway, and they can bring all that capabilities and learning to their other stores. So the forecourt industry is very fit, agile, able, and prepared to adapt to electric vehicles um, and all that comes with that. So is the change going to happen? I think everyone here knows that answer to that question, but I hope I might part with a little bit of insight. If I paint a picture, I wonder, has anyone else spotted this? So last year, 2016 versus 2017, we can conclude how 2017 went. You know, GDP was up 7.3. I think um, GNP is probably, a, for Ireland at least, it's a better uh, one to use. I think it's 5.3 or something in around that. Um, you can use some good sources of information, the NRA, now called TII, traffic uh, websites. If you can take a, a cursory look around, you'll find, generally speaking, traffic is up around 3.5%. Uh, you'll find, uh, here's another great website for you guys if you're looking into trying to get some insight to how things are moving, the Aero website, which is from Renewth University. It gives great, um, what would I call it, data on the census. Um, and it's only used the recent census, so in the coming ones, they'll be able to compare, you'll be able to compare shifts. Uh, but that helps us to confirm that we're actually now driving further. That won't come as a surprise. Housing crisis, hard to get houses, people are moving out, all that kind of thing. Um, and of course, th there's no great rocket science in this. The population's increasing. Last year, we're estimated to have increased alone, and last year alone, by about 0.75%. So painting this picture, everything's on the up. You know, our, we're busier than ever. We're driving further than ever. We're driving more than ever. Yet, motor fuels, for the first year, with the exception of our recessionary periods, 2008, 2012, we used less fuel. The change has already started. It's upon us. We need to start getting ready to move with this. You know, we call it the electric vehicles. I think a lot of that down in our own estimation is down to actually efficiencies that's come from the car manufacturers. Um, and I think ourselves, that's obviously driven by regular. Our own thoughts on that is that's driven by the regulation um, and it's driven by um, them trying to get their, their CO2 emissions lower, lower, and the life cycles of cars. But this change has started. The amount of motor fuel used in Ireland um, and you can use this as a good litmus test for what's happening in the UK, um, is now contracting despite everything else increasing. Okay, so what's going to happen? Well, as Quentin uh, um, introduced us, we don't actually know. We're all here to share our thoughts. We're very happy to share our thoughts on it, and we're very keen to hear your thoughts, run back and change our thoughts then afterwards. But um, we've compiled, uh, um, what would I call it, a list of these variables and try to estimate what's going to happen. Um, uh, it's, an ev it's an evolving thought process. It's a, it's a working document as such. We had last year, my role as head of commercial fuels, uh, part of my job among uh, leading some of the business units is to estimate what demand will be like. Um, I think that's a very difficult question uh, to answer. But what we do is we go and look at all the variables and how they might move. Um, predictability, predictability is easy for things like population growth, economic growth, and by and large, you can say it, but as you get into that electric vehicle area, it becomes a little bit more difficult um, to estimate. The adoption rate, the, the price of the, the vehicles will certainly drive it, but when's that going to happen? Will lithium become a, a problem to source? Um, we're not going to answer those questions. We're very much here to hear what everyone else says and watch that trend. Um, Regulation and tax incentives, they're going to be hugely influential. We saw, I think I've seen in Denmark, they took the foot off, they reduced the incentives, and the EVs dropped. Um, you know, what's Ireland going to do? Uh, there, you know, things like we have now, the BIK is now, um, the zero BIK on electric vehicles. That's a great incentive. Companies can now buy cars for employees who are not doing huge mileage, huge mileage and they're not taxed. But again, we still have this range anxiety, so it's very difficult to predict. Again, we're feeling our way around. One that we see as a huge game changer is that TAS, uh, Transport as a Service. Um, I'm not sure what many, I would estimate many would have seen the Rethink X report from uh, the US la uh, came out last year where it's really heavily reliant on vehicles becoming autonomous. That would be a significant game changer because it's a little bit more, um, we all stop 
buying cars and we just use autonomous cars, things like that, that would dramatically impact our markets. So we p compile all these, and the truth of it all is we'll just watch them and watch the trends. And estimate if trends go left or right or up or down, what we'll do in response. We have a fair idea, sorry, we have an estimate of what we think is going to happen. Um, and we'll say to you, we're happy to share that. Again, all we're doing is compiling consensus of opinions and preparing to adapt. To give you an example of how uh, difficult it is to estimate, you know, we've looked at and read many, many reports, as I'm sure many of you here have, and try and see what's happening. And you can see here these guys who are self-claimed experts in all this of doing reports, Goldman, JP Morgan, Merrill, and UBS, um, they're varying. But you can kind of see from collating all those reports you know, you go, something, something's going to happen in around 25, 2025, 2030. There's a bit of a shift going to happen there if you compile those predictions. And that will, we're taking that consensus and, and running with that. Um, I think we're estimating peak um, uh, standard vehicles to in around 2025, and 2030 is in around when we'll really see the electric vehicles. So appreciate I'll give you the, the, their very detailed graphs, but we, I'll give you the kind of synopsis of each of them. Uh, the first one there on the left, yes, car sales, we're going to increase it as our population's increasing and we're driving more. And bear in mind, Ireland is way behind many of our European counterparts with uh, investments into um, the likes of metros and things like that. Uh, so we're a decade plus away from even Dublin catching up on some of the European, uh, our European peers. So that, that in itself would reduce the amount of reliance on cars, but that's not happening. I appreciate things like transport and service, mobility, that can have an influence. But again, that's very much the urban area. Um, car sales, they're increasing again. Um, we would estimate then, on that ultimately, where it goes on the right. Um, your, and by the way, TPV is our private vehicles, which, which we'd be very much focused on primarily. Uh, yes, I think we'll be back to our Celtic Tiger level in around 20, 2020, 2021. Um, what's this mean for us, though? What are they fueled by? We're looking at that. Um, hybrids versus the uh, plug-in hybrids. And then the swap over. Using those consensus, rep those reports, and trying to develop a consensus for that, uh, like I said, we'll see the standard um, car moving out, we estimate, in 2025. And... Uh, probably heading towards the uh, 2030, and we'll see the, the uh, significant adaption towards the electric plug-in hybrids. Um, our own, particularly for Ireland, a little bit less so for, for UK, uh, that we feel the plug-in hybrids will become a far uh, more likely um, scenario than, than all electric. The all electric will be very much work where you have less range anxiety, and you have urban areas, and that's where they'll be far more um, prevalent particularly that that's more relevant for the UK. We feel the US, again, is a good bit behind simply because they're, 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 the cost of fuel is so cheap. So, what are we doing about it? Well, with all those variables and all those perma varying permutations for each variable, it's very difficult. What we are doing, though, like as much as we possibly can, and very much in this area, we're putting the customer at the center. Um, and we're... My words here, we're kind of hedging our bets. Um, certainly, we see electric as a big part of it, but you know, hydrogen is there, one of them. So in our Hempstead site in uh, Long Island, New York, we've installed our first hydrogen fuel cell um, fuel location. Uh, that's in conjunction with Toyota. If I looked uh, a number of years ago there, only recently, uh, we've uh, upgraded and installed fast car charging for the, with Nissan for the Nissan LEAF. Only last year, we installed a range of Tesla chargers um, in one of our service areas. And next year, you will see us install our first compressed natural gas uh, for the HGV market. Um, compressed natural gas in itself has limitations. You very much need to be near the grid. So it's something which uh, I won't say a niche market, but not far off it. But again, our strategy is very much revolving around the customer, what they need. I often get and bump into people down the streets and saying, Darryl, you know, why aren't you putting in uh, 20 charges there tomorrow morning? Well, we've got to respond to market demand. We're certainly ready and prepared to respond to market demand. Market demand isn't quite there. We're watching it and looking for those trends, hence why engaging with our peers here and seeing what they think and seeing what sales and what consumer shifts are happening. Um, we're certainly keen to develop the capabilities to be able to respond to that. 
and I'm very much here in an, in an open, collaborative uh, environment, say, if there's things you guys see that you want to do and it involves uh, a folk court as part of the ecosystem, by all means, talk to us. We're all ears, uh, and we'd love to engage and do more and see what we can do. So long, again, as it revolves around the customer. The customer will ultimately decide everything. Like, you can't, like we mentioned, our Quinta mentioned earlier, you can't necessarily force regulation. The customer will always go for what's convenient to them. And that's how things, in our opinion, will shift. Um, so, takeouts from this presentation, I think uh, the key thing is we're very much part of the ecosystem. Um, and we want to impress upon you that we want to stay part of that system and stay connected with all you guys in the industry. Uh, the change has definitively started. There is no doubt about it. It's now happening. There's less fuel being imported into this country, uh, even though we're doing more. Um, how have we mitigated our risk to be able to survive in this Red Queen race? Um, well, we've, for starters, we've, uh, and in fairness to Apple Green, we're probably the, the, the leaders in this, uh, and, and certainly a lot of our competitors have now caught up. But we became a food company who also sells energy, fuel. Uh, we're very much you, you changing towards the word energy as opposed to saying petrol, diesel, because you know, that's going to start um, becoming watered down by the time we more electric, EV, maybe a bit of hydrogen, things like that, um, and certainly some compressed nat natural gas. Uh, there is no doubt uh, within all uh, us in the forecourt industry, change is on the horizon, um, and we have to be prepared to change it. Be under no uh, illusions that the forecourt industry in Ireland, uh, and I would say it's actually dramatically changed in the UK. You see a lot of those, those oil majors, they're actually pulling out to a reasonable degree, and you see the independents, the likes of Euro Garages, Apple Green as well, um, very much taking over forecourts, and they're far more flexible, adaptable companies that can react. Um, we're actively monitoring the market, so we're not running, running out and building a petrol station with 50 chargers and two petrol pumps yet. Um, that can, I'm not saying that can't happen, it most likely will at some stage, um, but we're not there yet. We're at watching what the customer wants. Um, and again, to part with about where we are with, uh, uh, within the ecosystem. Um, I'd like to use Ireland as a good example, seeing as we're at the forefront of the forecourt industry um, in Europe at least, and in some respects across the world. You know, 60% of our transactions in Apple Green are non-fuel. Now, if you think about that, I mean, if I even did a survey here, how many people um, in the last week have visited a forecourt? Could I try, try a show of hands? How many people have visited a forecourt? I'm going to roughly say 75, possibly even 80%. There's no way 80% of you guys needed petrol in the last uh, number of days. Um, it's for far more reasons. We deliver a far more, a, a greater service. Please don't underestimate the culture and the, um, the psychometrics behind that and people commuting, particularly the transient consumer. Um, if, even if they're driving an electric car, even if they have enough charge, we, have a, we provide services such as 80 plus percent of those who drive into a forecourt, someone uses the toilet. Uh, sorry, that, that, particular for, that particular statistic is for our motorway service areas. Um, Apple Green have moved now, f um, and it's continuing to see our latest annual report actually out today, stroke tomorrow, and um, 30, less than 30% of our profits come from fuel. We're f that has been a, a, a part of our strategy. I'm going back from about five, six, eight years ago um, when we started to mitigate and divest from driving just fuel oriented business to being a service and providing a lot more value for the consumer, the transumer. The relevance of that is as we move into the, uh, as I call it, the Red Queen race and this big lot of, uh, amount of uncertainty that's coming, we can still be very, very relevant. Even, with, you know, even if we can change and have fast chargers there that can charge and many cars in two and 10 minutes and things like that, and we couldn't necessarily get there. You know, we can still be very, very, and will be very, very relevant. Um, the consumers have more uh, demand than just simple petrol uh, and diesel, and you'll see that along around the UK, the likes I mentioned, Euro Garages and other, other competitors, where the traditional oil majors have only ever provided oil, we've been far more innovative in the independence and provided far more service. Probably, a little, again, a little bit more relevant for the transient consumers. Um, that's generally my sense on it. Electric vehicles is something that's happening. We're happy to embrace it, um, and we're very happy to engage with many of our peers within the industry if there's thoughts on what we could do and the opportunities that could arise that make 
uh, I'm going to say things convenient and easier for the consumer. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone um, uh, wants to catch up with me later on. Thank you very much.